All righty. Welcome again, everybody. Um, excited to get started here. Uh, John, I think we're ready to go. Um, continue to talk here about the health systems and home infusions and the top reasons some lose millions annually. Yeah. Good morning, Lee. Good morning. Or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm in the central. <laughs> so good morning to everybody. I see people are still uh, coming back in and piling in. That's awesome. So, yeah. And so let's get started, Lee. Sounds great. Um, John, so with your experience on you know, why some health systems and home infusion providers are losing annually, I'm excited to kind of get your take there. Yeah, so, I mean, this was a, a topic we had been talked a, a lot about, right, at, at ProChan, you know, so everybody knows we'll kind of open the kimono at ProChan. We're the largest, you know, home infusion and, and infusion center um, reimbursement revenue cycle partner for outsourcing. And so a lot of folks uh, around the health system world you know, have been talking to us lately and, and, and we do see a lot losing millions and, and we don't use that lightly. We, we mean that, you know, millions. And, and so, uh, but, but first, before I do that, Leah, what I want to do is I want to talk out of the gate because I think there's, you know, we're going to talk about some negative stuff. But let's talk about the positive. Every health system should be in home infusion or infusion centers, you know, the, that's getting a little mixed Lee now. You know, our AIC policy, you know, let's just say infusion, right? Every health should, and, and a few reasons why, you know, um, their operations. Like, I mean, it's just part of their operations. You know, they're very good. Hospitals are fantastic at operations, fantastic at care. Obviously, this is a mode of health care. And so it is very natural to them and, 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 and quite good at it. Um, their referral system, it becomes a close, right? It's a closed a loop, you know? I mean, these referrals are going out of the house. You know, health systems are looking for dollars. They're going out to these big other fo folks who are doing all of this home infusion and AIC. And the, but really, whoever controls the script controls the patient. Uh, I hate to use language like that. That's just the nature of it. Um, and so when you lock up that referral, you know, it shouldn't be surprising to you that that's what comes back. And so you have the referrals, the patient continuum of care, you're able to care for the patient all the way from acute to post acute, which is really, really important to health systems. You know, accreditations are really important in the infusion industry. You already have a leg up when you're a health system. You don't have to wrestle with the URACs and the ACHCs and JCOs. You already have that. You have the ability to do that and the ability to maintain, which is really important. And finally, just historically, they've been they've been proven to be pretty dang good at it. I mean, we're talking about, you know, years, decades that health systems, a lot of health systems have been doing home infusion by a lot of great people, and they are taking care of their patients. They're doing really, really well. With that being said, though, you know, there is a, a history here, uh, you know, Lee, there really is. Yeah, John, I appreciate you sharing those reasons why providers should be in the home infusion space. Um, you know, so with that, it kind of leads to the question, if historically health systems have been set up as successful providers of infusion therapy, why, I mean, why are so many losing millions of dollars in annual write-offs? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. There's really three reasons that we see more than anything. Now, let me say, there could be for those of you on here who are in home infusion and frustrated or you're in home infusion, uh, AIC and you're doing well, those of you who are thinking about getting into it, there could be 19 reasons, right? These are the big three, okay? Um, you know, really, it's just reason number one, Lee. Yeah, um, so reason number one being, you know, they use hospital central reimbursement services to do infusion revenue cycle. Um, why is that an issue? Yeah, this this never works. And, and we always have to have this moment. This this never works. And I can share story after story about the dynamic that happens in health systems a lot, Lee, are power dynamics. They can be political places, okay? Those of you on here who work at health systems, you know they're full of amazing people. But the reality of it is sometimes it can be political, just like any large corporation can. And sometimes the centralized billing portion who does you know emergency room and clinic billing and all the stuff that's much easier, that person – he or she, that group wants to maintain. Um, this never works. Home infusion, billing, and collections is a unique set of challenges that they are not encountered by the hospital, the traditional medical office. And, um, you know, the reality of the situation is that um, they're not prepared to do it. And it would be ask, like asking someone who, and I don't mean to be, but someone who's gotten used to cooking, like maybe just straight line food, like burgers and hot dogs to now do quiches, 
in Fragua, I mean, it's not going to work, you know. And even if you got good at the quiche to move in between the two, you don't have the ability to do that. You can't move from a quiche to a hot dog and back and forth. One is a very simplified billing, but ours it isn't. And I want to talk a little bit why it's so difficult. I mean, number one is home infusion. Infusion in general has high specialization complexity. Home infusion services are highly specialized. Wide range of uh, therapies, medication, and every single one of them have their own billing and administration protocol. Those centralized services are used to just codes and they just know the code and they bang it out. And it's the same for United Blue Cross as, as it is for Molina, as it is for Medicare. That is not the case in infusion. Each one of them is different. So services are standardized in the hospital, but precise documentation and coding based upon the drug, the administration method, and the equipment is what's needed. It's very, very, very difficult. Uh, Medicare and accreditation requirements. I can't tell you how many folks call us just on Medicare for hospitals and just say, listen, we, we, we can't, we can't get past this. And so the Medicare's coverage for home infusion involves strict guidelines that are very, very hard. And if you don't observe this, what I'm saying, if you have the same person billing these normal, you know, emergency room codes that are very easy and then going to home infusion, uh, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna quit or they're gonna do a bad job, but they're not going to do it. well. I can tell you that. Um, so providers have to navigate these regulations really, really careful to get paid, and a lot of them aren't. Um, you know, the detailed time rules and the service codes, you know, that most aren't used to, you know, home infusion therapy is impacted by the administration time of the medication. And so those rules on how time is counted and billed, you know, the minimum, the maximum, all that stuff is incredibly different to a centralized team who won't understand that and will not do that well. And then, of course, just the diverse billing codes and the payer policies. Every payer is different. Every code is different. So you do not have the standardization. And you're talking about drugs, supply, equipment, and often nursing. And so all of those are different. Comprehensive understanding of very payer policies and every payer is different. You're going to hear us say that a lot. I know it's going to be frustrating for some of the folks that are that are on the webinar, but that's, that's just the nature uh, of what we're talking about. These aspects are crucial for ensuring that billing is done correctly and that reimbursement is maximized. And finally, um, complex insurance investigation and billing decision. You, they do not want to pay you because these are all high dollar claims. These aren't $800 claims. $2, We're talking about a $23,000 claim, $37,000 claim. I can tell you right now, your payer would love to not pay that. So we're going to have to argue. We're going to have to make sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted. And even if it's not, sometimes it gets denied. You have to go back, put proper paperwork and say, you should have denied this. This is a false denial. It's all a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so it is not easy. It is not easy at all. So, John, you're saying the bottom line here is a normal hospital reimbursement department is just not built for infusion reimbursement. Right. So that's it. So if you try to do that through our normal one, hey, we're just going to let these folks handle it. I'm telling you right now, I can tell you a story right now of someone who losing one, writing off $1.3 million a year. And unfortunately, and I won't tell you the health system, of course, but a major health system in the Midwest said, we, there's nothing we can do about it because our EVP of reimbursement, um, that, that person is a very powerful person. And when we went and we talked and we sent it up the line that, hey, we need to do this. They took it as a slight on them and their department, and they were very frustrated, and that would impact our career. So even in that case, we have a health system who is losing $1.3 million who could have those dollars in, and they said, we just have to keep it this way because kind of there's some politics involved. So I would just tell you, in general, one reason why um, there are, are a good amount of health systems losing and riding off millions of dollars is because they're trying to kind of put a, a very – and I, I would say square peg into a round hole, but it's not a, a, a peg that is very oddly shaped that there, there's no, there's no hole just made. You're going to have to make your own. Right. And they're trying to put that in there. It's not going to work. I appreciate that. I'm going to move on to reason two. Before we do that, if there's any questions on this stuff, please just use the Q and a function down below. Um, John, you know, reason number two here, um, hospitals try to bill and hospital EMR utilizing two systems, um, one for dispense and one for RCM. Expand on that. Yeah, yeah, this is a big one too. And and, and really this is driven mostly by Epic, right? We, we kind of live with health systems. I mean, you know, not all of them, but a, a lot of them. And of course, the major ones, they kind of live in the Epic world. And that makes sense. When you spent 
you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars on Epic, you would like to get the most out of that EMR. That makes total sense to everyone, I would think. And so they want to hold as much data inside and workflow inside the hospital EMR. Uh, but until that mainline EMR has a dedicated infusion workflow and, and revenue cycle management functionality, it ends up disastrous. And I do not use that word like it ends up disastrous. I mean, if you want to call me offline, I can tell you uh, some of the disastrous things that happen when we try to say, well, we're going to do this in Epic and we're going to do this over here. And we're going to bill it in, you know, CPR Plus or Keratin or Bright Tree or We Infuse or Novalon, one of these infusion based systems. But we're, we really want to maintain all of our stuff in Epic. I, I cannot tell you how disastrous that has been for so many. And they just keep saying, okay, we're just going to figure it out. And, and, and you're not. Until that, um, until that system is fully built, uh, it, it does not work. And so, what, what are the results for that, Lee? One, you have data fragmentation. You got two systems, completely different data, how they chore chore graph that data. Um, it's completely difficult to maintain any kind of comprehensive uh, view of the revenue cycle or patient care. So because the nomenclature, the data systems, all of it's wrong. Oh, we're going to house referral over here. We're going to pick up over here. And then this person's going to put it over here. And I cannot tell you how bad that works out. And I'm talking about some of the most storied um, health systems in the country uh, have tried or are trying this to, and I'm going to continue to use this word because I don't have another word for it, disastrous outcomes, the loss of millions of dollars, uh, increase errors in omission. So when you don't have an integration between the systems, you're going to have errors. And we thought you did that over here, that we thought you did that over here. Data entry was off. We don't have a way to see it. The coding is wrong because they put the code over here, but it didn't get transferred over here. And all of that obviously leads to claim denials, um, which, again, I want to remind you, the, the payer is looking for any, any, any eye. Imagine a world. This is the world we live in, folks, okay? It's, it's, my, it's my everyday world. Imagine a world uh, in which you're back in college and you have to write a 10,000-word essay, right? And you get a zero on it because you didn't dot one eye. Or you get a zero on it because you didn't put a comma in one sentence in that 10,000 word essay. That's your world of billing right now. They're looking for one tiny thing so they don't pay you that 23,000, that 37,000 IG claim, that Ocrevus, that high level specialty infusion claim. They're, they're, they want that. So, we're kind of buying into that system to them and giving it over to them because we're doing it in two different systems, which is only going to create those errors. Obviously, it's inefficient. Obviously, it's redundant. So we don't have enough people anyway. So when we're doing it in two systems, we have to end up doubling our work. And, you know, we need more people. We're already understaffed. And, of course, it shouldn't be a surprise that we have delayed, you know, reimbursement. Okay? All that's going to affect your cash flow. All right? Um, I, there's also compliance risk. Listen, I ran into uh, a health system and I told them, Hey, they said, Hey, we, we, we did this over at Epic. So just have a biller go and, 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 uh, verify what we dispensed. And I, I, I froze. I said, we, we can't have a biller go on the record and verify what a pharmacist dispense. I, I don't think any accreditation body would say that that's okay. I think that's a compliance risk. You know, you're having a person who's a biller. This is a person who's a billing specialist. They are not a pharmacist, not a tech. And they're saying, yeah, that's what went out the door. That's And 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 the reality of the situation, if we're doing one and one, and then we're just going to pick it up and bill it in another system, those are the problems that are happening. Uh, poor communication coordination should go without, you know, saying, you know, seamless communication n doesn't exist because the dispensing and billing system, they don't coordinate. And again, every time you separate them, you're going to have larger and larger uh, cracks, which is obviously going to affect patient care and financial performance. And finally, if the data is bad in, we have an old, an old saying, um, you know, garbage in, garbage out when it comes to data. So if we're creating garbage, guess what our reporting and analytics is going to be? It's going to be garbage because we get it from two different systems. We can't marry the data. We can't do anything of that nature. This is not a good solution. So with that, you know, being said, uh, the bottom line behind reason number two is, uh, you know, health system infusion providers need a single dedicated system for dispensing revenue cycle. What do you, yeah. what do you see by this? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the reality of it is whether you like it or not, and I'm sure there's a lot of people on here who do not like that answer, and, and I would love to give you a better answer. 
But until a health system EMR has a home and infusion center workflow and RCM capability that are designed for that, you're going to have to have a second system that to work in if you want it to be successful. You are not going to be able to do everything in our system because we want that easy and then just push it out. It is going to lead to really, really bad outcomes. All right, John. Um, so reason number three here, uh, you know, they're understaffed and maybe don't even know it. Yeah, I mean, this is the big one. If you've followed, if anybody follows me and, you know, my career and what, you know, at, at National Home Infusion Association or in a, in a couple of weeks, I'll be at National Infusion Center Association in Vegas. Um, this, I kind of have a megaphone I carry around the country screaming at everybody. You're 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 way more understaffed and you don't even know it, you know, and, and health systems are some of the worst um, just being critically understaffed. You know, most don't even know they're understaffed. You know, they just assume that the same staff they needed 10 years ago is what they have. And it isn't. You know, again, I'll point to the fact that payers are increasing compliance every single year. Drugs that you didn't need. You have to have uh, this medical documentation now you didn't need three years ago. Why is that? Because they want to not pay you. They want to delay paying you. And so which each of these, you know, additions the common biller and collector must put up more time per claim, which means we need more people. So over the years, that's added up tremendously. And that's a staple to the the play, the payers uh, playbook. I mean, they're like, hey, you just keep thinking you need nine people on your team. When we do a, a analysis, people call us all the time. Hey, can you run a consulting? Sure, we'll run an analysis. We come back. Okay, you should have 16 people on your RCM team. And, and if they were on video, they'd fall out of their chair. I, I hear this crash. I just assume they fell out of their chair. Like, we have eight people. You say 16, like, yeah, if you want to get paid 97% of your dollars, uh, you're going to have 16. And they say, oh, well, we can't afford that. I'm like, well, you're right, off $900,000 a year. I think you can't afford it. Well, then we can't find them. Okay, well, that's a different question. But the vast majority of people are very, very, very understaffed. Um, so how did we get here, Lee? That's the question. Guys, we're still we're still in covid we just don't know it, right? You get reminded every once in a while when, you know, you see a mask, okay? But the reality of the situation is since 2020 of February, hospital employment has decreased by nearly 94,000, and it's still there today, okay? It's still 94,000 less people in the hospitals across the country today. Job fair uh, vacancies for healthcare roles, um, have it, have increased significantly. Now you see nursing that's up thirty that percent. There's some rest there, but the reality is is that we're all trying to hire and they're not there. Hospitals have experienced almost a sixteen percent increase in labor expenses. So what's happening here? We have less people, and the people we have want more money. So that's our issue. You know, this increase is driven by the need to hire more expensive labor and uh, contract labor to fill staffing gaps. We're having to lean in and say, hey, I just got to find people, okay? Because so, we, we can't find the, the, the people who want to work who can do it. And so overall hospital expenses have risen by 20%, 20%. And labor costs for the first time in history are 50% are of total hospital expenses. That's the reality of where we are. We are understaffed um, and the payers know it. Uh, we have operational challenges. The shortage of administrative chat leads to increase in billing. Of course it does. You know, higher rates. Listen, less people. I got to get 19 claims out the door today. I got to get 19 claims out the door or my boss will be mad at me. How likely, if I'm rushing those 19 claims that we've already said are very specific, have specific codes, specific things, how likely are they all to be correct? Not. But I need to get all 19 out. It's Friday. I need to get them out before 4.30. So my boss can say, there's no unbilled here. There, you know, there's nothing that's left. And all of that creates, we often talk about at ProChamp, um, kind of a factory, that, re that, that revenue cycle is a factory, right? And each system puts on the widget until the widget gets done and then it's ready to go, right? That's revenue cycle. Things come in from intake and wherever they go wrong, wrong billing code, wrong this, wrong MPI, whatever it is, it's wrong as it goes all the way through. It goes all the way to the payer, gets denied, and comes all the way back two weeks later, and we start all over again. Now, that's fine if we do it once, but we're doing it 15 times a day. 
And then tomorrow there'll be 15 new claims and it's stacking up and we don't have the people to do it. And that's what's creating losses. And then of course we have, so what happens to our really, really smart people, our awesome people? Well, they leave us because they're like, we don't have enough people. I'm overworked. I'm working too many hours. You know, I'm the only one here now who knows what I'm doing. And so they leave us. And so even in home infusion that have experienced RCMs and their own team, they're calling us and telling us we, we lost some of our best people. Yeah, because they're overworked because you're understaffed. And finally, I don't care what we do. We all have to understand that everything, everything comes back to patient care. And I get it. You're like, well, you're in finance. But the reality of the situation is uh, everything comes back to poor quality for our patients, no matter what. If we're not getting paid, if we're not fully staffed, if we're not flush with cash, then somewhere down the line that will interrupt and, 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 and mess with our patient care. And so increased patient acuity and longer hospital stays, all of these things are coming out of, the, uh, of this massive uh, problem with um, uh, overworked, understaffed people. Yeah, John. So after seeing the challenges and, you know, how we got here, um, the bottom line being, you know, health system infusion providers are understaffed and it's getting worse. Yeah, that's it. I wish I had better news and I wish I had a fancier way to say it. But health system infusion providers are understaffed and it's getting worse. And I hear about it constantly, you know, and they say, well, we're just going to go out and find people. OK, well, where are you going to find them at? You know, with the people who know this already know what they're worth and they cost a lot of money and they can move it anytime they want. If they come into your, your operation and six months later, an infusion uh, billing manager or infusion billing collection manager or an actual collector or manager or collector or biller, they can, they know that they can go anywhere they want right now. They can go work because that's what 2020 did, right? Hey, I don't have to come into an office. I can go work for a California pharmacy. I can go work for a health system in Florida. I can go to one in New York. I can live in Wyoming with this uh, very good rate of living, and I can work and get a California pharmacy uh, or a California health system can pay me what they pay their people. So we're at this place where the actual provider has or the the, the worker has all the leverage. John, so we just named, you know, three issues or three reasons um, with a lot of information, a lot of data. Um, you know, what what strategies are hospitals using to combat these headwinds here? Yeah, I think they're they're trying to use several things, right? You know, I mean, we're, we're trying, Epic's trying to get their EMR, uh, their infusion EMR out the door. It's not there yet, but, you know, everybody says right around the corner. So for some, that would be a solution that they could work in one. Um, you know, we're kind of opening the kimono here, like. We're named, our name's ProChan. If you don't know what we do, we're, you know, the largest provider of RCM. So for us, the, the, the biggest change you can do is considering outsourcing your revenue cycle management. We would tell you that the most successful ones have done that, you know, and, and here's why. If you don't want to blame, if you don't want to listen to me, then let's, let's, let's take three reasons why uh, health systems are going. So uh, the survey data says it, you know, number one. Um, you know, 2023 survey conducted by uh, CWH found that 61% of healthcare plan to outsource their RCM tasks within the next 24 months. So 10 years ago, nobody was outsourcing. Now it's every week somebody else throws their hands up and says, forget it, forget it. We're, we're, we got to get out of this financial. We got to get back to taking care of our patients. We didn't go to pharmacy school to do this. We, we want to get back to t taking care of their patients. Another survey says that two-thirds of respondents cited workforce challenges as the major. Yeah, they just can't find the people, and they're done. They want to go back. So the survey data says it. The market growth, I mean, we live in a capitalistic society, so, you know, mar market growth tells us what's happening. You know, the global market for RCM outsourcing for uh, healthcare was – uh, valued at 14 million in its experience, it's going to go to 27 billion by 2027. And I can tell you right now, I know that's true because I have three calls a week. After I get off of this, I have two calls, both with health systems the rest of my day, all talking about, should we do this? You know, so I can tell you that in real world. And finally, the last thing I tell you is when you see large health systems start to go, you, you can you can know when you start to see Novant, UCI, we start to see all these big, big, big health systems that finally say we have to go. Those are the last ones, right? You know, so Conifer, Optum, ProChant, R1, Ensemble, all of them are picking up, you know, major, major contracts.
for pharmacy and home infusion. And the reason is because uh, they're all choosing to, to go and, 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 and outsource because they're, they're, that's where they are. They're done with that. So currently, ProChan has over 30 health systems that we do their RCM. And so I, I would say that if, if 30 are coming to one vendor of our size, then, uh, you know, I think you can trust it. I think you can trust that this is the way the wind is blowing for surely. So I'm sure there's questions. I saw a few come in. Yeah, uh, John, we do have a couple of questions. Um, we got about three minutes left, so let's knock that out. Yeah, um, so I'll go real quick uh, here with the first one. Um, what do you feel about Epic's new solution? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So and I, I think I mentioned that a second ago. So, you know, we're all kind of waiting on Epic. Epic has a home infusion solution that they've been working on for quite a while. You know, they're coming back. Uh, I, I I think it's in beta. I, listen, we're excited about it. I mean, we're very excited about it. Anytime uh, a major technology uh, provider can provide more options to clients and health systems, then we're excited about it. You know, we haven't looked at it yet. We certainly believe that we'll be working in it for our, our clients at some point. And so we're really excited about it. Awesome. I appreciate that. I'll go straight to the next one here for you. Um, where would you recommend we look for staff that is experienced? Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Um, you know, uh, I, I would, I would, unfortunately, I think the only way that you get staff that's experienced is stealing from someone else. Uh, right now, I, I would say it takes about a year to take a person uh, and turn them into a competent infusion biller or collector. The problem is after that year, they start to know how valuable they are and they can leave you at any time and you're back on that hamster wheel. So I don't have a good answer for you there. I mean, we hire obviously a lot, so we're out scouring, you know, um, you know, we're looking for, you know, folks, um, most of those folks are seasoned and they're a little, a little older. Um, so we don't have a great base of young talent in the RCM, you know, so I, unfortunately, I don't have a great question for that. We're all looking for that. I appreciate that insight there. Um, go with one more here, just real quick. Uh, do you okay. have an infusion system recommendation? So no. Um, so anybody who's thinking about, okay, okay. So, you know, everybody knows, you know, CPR plus is, is sunsetting. And so everybody's kind of rushing, run for the hills here and find your, so you're, you're talking about, you know, you know, CPR plus care tend it's, it's, it's new, uh, counterpart, uh, bright tree, we infuse a Novalon universals out there. And so I, I would definitely be talking to all of them. I would see a demo of all of them. And then I would have some trusted folks and ask for references and ask for references of someone who's live. Say, hey, I, I want to talk to someone who's live on your system. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to see a screenshot. I don't want to, I want to see how this works in a live. You know, a, a lot of softwares can give you a great sandbox we call it where everything works perfectly but i don't want to see that i want to thank uh thank you for your time and everybody yeah, that joined of um i know everybody's super busy and to take time to sit with you and myself uh, means a lot to us and if there's any questions please feel free to reach out to john and i yeah thanks lee thank you so much